What's up y'all? Today's video is a long one. I basically uh, have been growing these mushrooms for, I don't know, over a month now. And documenting every step of the way how I did things and how I, you know, why I did it. But this is a gourmet mushroom called Deer Caps. And it is, I grew this, this is a uh, dung slash um, enriched soil loving mushroom. So... There's like 14,000 species of mushroom, so you can't do it by species, but uh, the two broad categories are dung slash uh, enriched soil loving and then uh, wood loving mushrooms. So I decided to grow a enriched soil loving mushroom for my first attempt and to document it and all the steps and process involved in getting uh, a, this is the first flush, so in getting to this point, whereas, uh, from basically from spore or liquid culture, uh, starting there and going step by step process all the way to the end, which is the fruits, which are these. So, um, since it's such a long video, the whole purpose of the video is to kind of be a, a guide for beginners to be able to go through step by step and follow along and make sure that they are successful on their first attempt at growing. So, what I did is if you tap on the title of the video, uh, I'm going to put a list of what topics are covered at what time in the video. So you can just click to that time in the video to watch whatever you're trying to watch. But this whole video is going to be basically in, you know, step-by-step -step order from start to finish um, of how to get here. But like I said, it covers agar and all the other processes, making agar, things like that liquid culture inoculation so if there's anything specifically you're interested in seeing and not having to try and find too hard just go to click on the title go down there'll be a big list of all the contents and then uh that'll be uh how this video will be the the easily the most easily used by uh i guess people watching it but uh if you haven't yet subscribed uh, and you want to see more stuff like this go ahead and subscribe and like and I'm planning on doing another grow, this time with a wood loving, um, wood loving species. And I later in this video, I inoculate a few agar plates with some uh, liquid cultures that I bought, um, antler reishi, reishi, uh, lion's mane, and uh, turkey tail. I'm leaning towards growing the lion's mane out of those wood loving uh, medicinal slash um, gourmet mushrooms. But if you guys wanna see one of the other ones, let me know in the comments. Or if you wanna see the lion's mane grow, let me know in the comments as well. I'm probably gonna do that in a bag inside a monotub, just like this. So um, let me know which one of those you wanna see me grow, cause I'll probably do a follow up video to this, growing the wood loving mushrooms. But either way, uh, like I said, Take a look down the, down the uh, description and uh, check out what all this video covers and hopefully it'll help you out, if you're, especially if you're a beginner trying to figure out where to start and how to do this step by step. It'll be the, uh, a good uh, resource for you. Either way, let me get into it now and I'll start with the uh, introduction I filmed a long time ago. So here we go. What's up everybody? It's about 2.30 a.m. and that's as good a time as any to do a video on home mycology. Lately, I haven't been sleeping like, terribly every day, so in the middle of the night, I lay in bed and I sit there and read on my phone and study and watch videos. And lately, my main thing I've been interested in is home mycology. Um, mycology, this, this is going to be, by the way, this is going to be the Cliff Notes version of mycology. Whereas, it's not going to get you an A plus on the test. But it's going to cover everything that you need to know to make a B, B plus. <laughs> the minimum amount of subject matter to make a B or B plus on the test. It's going to get you what you need to know, especially what most people want to know, which is how to grow mushrooms at home. We call that home mycology, even though mycology is a way bigger field. So this will get you from point A, the spore, to the finish line which is fruiting bodies and beyond that actually is what this video is meant to do uh, 
but we're calling it home mycology because that's how this is referred to almost everywhere you go. Um, mycology is actually the study of the kingdom fungi. So it's a study of all fungi, which is uh, includes yeast, mold, um, mushrooms, obviously, truffles, toasts. It, it includes a lot of things. This entire kingdom, which is what mycology refers to, but the vast majority, when people say mycology, they're talking about mushroom cultivation. But since this is a home mycology video, I'm gonna go over the uh, brief introduction of you know just everything, and kind of try and cover everything about what's what. But it's not gonna take long. I'm gonna get right down to mushroom cultivation once this intro's over. Um, I'm gonna go after I get done with all these videos. I'm gonna go and put a little uh, in the description. I'm gonna write little subjects each step of the way and what time they start. So I'm gonna start with the introduction now. I'm gonna go into materials. I'm gonna go into uh, you know talking about sterilization, sanitization, talking about uh, my kind of analogy for how mycelium works. And then I'm gonna start talking about uh, introducing spores, agar work, uh, inoculating grain jars, and basically all this kind of goes with together once you get past the spores into a whole section just mycelium just manipulation and then end up with finish with a building a monotub which is basically the fruiting chamber and then uh, how to basically get from spore all the way through the fruit at the end which is the mushrooms but so like I was saying study of the kingdom fungi um, Mushrooms are just a small part of that, but they're the part that most everybody's interested in. Fungi is basically anything that produces spores and feeds on organic material. Um, they're almost all mushrooms, or sorry, excuse me, almost all fungi uh, produce mycelium and, and uh, kind of propagate themselves through mycelium, except for yeast, which is a single cell, um, the one single cell kind of fungi, and it, it, it does a di slightly different uh, route to propagate itself and, and to feed on um, organic material, but we're going to push yeast aside, just know it's there, and it's not actually producing mycelium. Um, it has hyphae, which is the basis of mycelium, but yeast doesn't make a multicellular mycelial networks or, or hyphae networks. So now that we've got yeast out of the way, everything else in mycology uses mycelium. Hyphae is the, uh, the basic kind of building block tubular structure which starts to grow from the spores and it is kind of a strand or, or a branch-like, a tree-like structure. It's tiny. It's the microscopic structure of mycelium a bunch of hyphae grows and grows and grows, and when it grows, and uh, basically a collection of hyphae is mycelium. So now we're at mycelium. Mycelium is the uh, the um, basically the network that it takes the multicellular network that it takes to get you know uh, colonized areas and and to, and to uh, produce spores. This is a little a little more in depth than I wanted to go. But either way, so hyphae is what makes it possible for the fungi to feed on organic material. Hyphae secretes an enzyme, breaks down the organic material for the um, fungi to be able to absorb it. So that's all I'm gonna say about hyphae. Mycelium, and, and now the rest of this is, the rest of this is getting a little more macro level into what's important about mycology. <laughs> so, the way I like to describe mycology or, or you know, going from spore to mycelium and, and producing mushrooms is the spore is like a match. It takes two spores to start a fire or create mycelium. When two spores combine, they create mycelium, and mycelium is like the fire. So the entire you know, field of home mycology mushroom cultivation is basically based on starting the fire with the match or the or the flint stone, whatever you want to call the, the spores in this analogy. And then once you start the fire, which is the mycelium, all of home mycology is basically based around keeping that mycelium going, keeping the fire going, 
expanding the fire and then and then uh, getting it from one spot to another colonizing it more making sure it's clean expanding it more to a bigger substrate expanding it more and finally when you got enough of it and a big enough network fruiting those mycelium to produce fruits is what you're looking for so that being said now let's get into the I'm going to go ahead and start talking about the, um, the materials here. The main materials used for home mycology, these are not all of them, but this is a pretty good overview of what kind of materials you need. The number one uh, most important piece of equipment for home mycology is a pressure cooker or pressure canner that is capable of getting to 15 psi. That is the magic number in home mycology for sterilizing things. So you do them for different amounts of time, 30 minutes, two hours, an hour and a half, whatever. But 15 PSI is the magic number for getting you to the um, pressure you need to, to sterilize things appropriately. Um, here's some other things, but like uh, gloves, basically, your hands have yeast, your skin, everything all over them all the time. So you cover those to keep them clean, uh, keep the uh, whatever might come off your hand and skin and get in what you're working with. Here's a flame, some kind of flame source for flame sterilization. Uh, cleaning products like isopropyl alcohol, 99% is a little too high, 70 is fine. And this is for sanitization, obviously. These aren't absolutely necessary, but they help a lot. These are scalpel set here. And then there's a monotub, which is a what I'm going to build uh, or to make a uh, fruiting chamber for the final fruits. So there's a common theme, and actually, usually in these in these uh, materials, people would usually have a a steel air box or a laminar flow hood, and those two things are basically a way to keep your work area clean from spores floating through the air and, and contaminants because in the air there's you know spores of all kinds of different stuff bacteria mold fungi whatever there's all kinds of junk just floating around the air all the time and that's that is the main trick to home mycology is keeping your area and your substrate and your your whatever you're working on clean so the common theme across all these <laughs> things here is uh, the whole purpose of most of these things is to keep your area and your your grain, your egg area, whatever it is, everything you're working with, the whole point of most of these things is keep it sterile and clean. Actually, almost all the tools in mycology are used to keep things sterile and clean. So that's, that's the, the biggest trick to this home mycology is sterilization and sanitization because from the moment you sterilize something, whatever you're working on, agar, grain, whatever, as soon as you sterilize something, as soon as you sterilize a knife, a scalpel, anything you're working on, from the moment you sterilize it, the clock starts ticking on how long it is until that is not sterile anymore, or, or basically how non-sterile it is as soon as you get done sterilizing it. So the key to home mycology being successful is keeping things sterile and sanitized and working quickly. And re-sanitizing and re-sterilizing the entire time you're working. You just you just go through the process of keeping things clean and re-cleaning things and keeping things clean and re-cleaning things over and over and over through the entire process of this stuff because that gives you the best chance of um, of success. And uh, like I said, a steel air box and a um, laminar flow hood are necessary things. But I use this, which is a, uh, a great, I use with oven tech, which I'll go into here in the next section. But uh, that's basically how this works. And uh, so like I said, my point is keeping everything clean is ideal, is, is the, uh, the main, the main, the main cornerstone, I guess, of successful mycology. But uh, here's, a, here's an example. This is a agar plate. And this is actually clean right now, there's nothing in there. So I can get away with having this out with the lid on it because it kind of locks away. Here's agar plate that's been colon agar plate that's been colonized by mycelium, and this was just uh, something I threw a grain 
of my uh, a colonized grain on the middle of there just to grow it out you can already see a little bit of a contamination right there which is it's harder to contaminate once it's all like fully colonized it's by, like this but uh, either way here's this is mycelium right here and it, it all started in this middle part right here and it grew out and uh, while I'm talking about mycelium let me talk about the two types here uh, the two main types of mycelium are uh, fluffy mycelium and rhizomorphic mycelium and this is mostly my rhizomorphic right here the fluffy kind is like described it's fluffy rhizomorphic is more branching um, you see the way that basically the hairs here they're kind of branching tubular hair uh, vein looking growth that's the kind of growth you want in home mycology so it's a it's an interesting it's, it's really this stuff is really interesting it's hard not to get sidetracked when I'm talking about it to different different uh, different things about it because there's just it all kind of goes together but the 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 entire process is going to be getting this mycelium all the way through but either way so like I was saying this is about home mycology which is growing of mushrooms the main two types of growing mushrooms at home are, uh, like I said before, fungi feeds on organic material. The two main types of mushrooms have evolved to feed on organic material are the type that uh, feed on equine dung, which is like horse or animals with hooves, four legs and hooves, their poop. And the other one is uh, fungi that feeds on uh, the uh, mushrooms that feed on decomposing wood. So those are the two main kind of gourmet mushrooms, or main kind of mushrooms in general that uh, people cultivate at home. The ones that form on equine dung and the ones that form on decomposing wood. In this video, I, so, so I started out super broad with fungi kingdom, and now I'm all the way down to growing one kind of mushroom. In this video, I'm gonna concentrate on growing the kind of mushroom that grows on equine dung. Specifically, it's gonna be a, a gourmet mushroom from South Carolina called deer caps, is what I got a spore print from my buddy to grow. So I'll be growing a gourmet mushroom called deer caps from spore, and uh, I'll be going through the entire process, and I'll show you how I basically light the fire with a spore and take that mycelium fire all the way from inoculating a agar plate all the way through fruiting it at the end and then making more spores. But either way, here we go. Let me start with the, uh, the first part of this process, with, which is getting your spores and inoculating. Uh, I'm going to inoculate grain jars and uh, some agar plates. And I'm going to start that right now and show you how I do that. Okay, here we go. Now I'm going to start with uh, inoculating. I'm going to inoculate one grain jar straight from the spore syringe. I'm going to um, inoculate three um, agar plates with the, I'll do one with a spore syringe, one just straight from the, uh, actually I'll do two of them with a spore syringe. I'm going to put the, some, of the, uh, some of the spore syringe in here. And I'm going to uh, do one of those out of there with an inoculation loop here. And the other one I'm going to do with um, just, uh, just a drop straight from the syringe onto the AR plate. So basically this is all the ways you can take your, your spores and, <clears throat> um, you know, inoculate AR and, and uh, um, grain jars. And also you can do liquid culture, basically the same thing, just put in a couple drops of your spores in there. But uh, also I've got my spore print, I'm going to go directly from the spore print in agar as well. So basically this is starting from spores, and obviously this is jumping around a little bit because I haven't showed you how to make the agar yet, or how to make the grain jars, but this is how the grain jar is going to be once it's pressure cooked, sterilized, and ready. And these are the, obviously the, the agar plates when they're all ready and already done ma being made and everything else. So... I'm going to go ahead and start with the uh, inoculating the 
I'm going to pour some in there first. Usually, what you get in the mail if you're if you're ordering spores or liquid culture, you're going to get a syringe like this. And uh, so, anytime I say from MSS, that means from a syringe, and it's going to come with a little chunky black spores in it. This is not very good because I basically just put some spores off a a, a spore print in here to use. But you can yeah, if you look really close, you can see them. But they're they're kind of mixed up and they're very faint. They're not as chunky as the ones you get from uh, somewhere online or whatever. It'll have a lot more spores in it, but this doesn't have that many. So, either way, point is, you take your spore syringe, you put this needle, oops, you put the needle on there, and then you take the needle cover off and try not to jack yourself because it is super sharp. And then first thing is, flame sterilizing the needle. Pow. Just want to do it till you get it red hot. There you go, it's flame sterilized. And a lot of people will take a, take a, uh, alcohol, wet alcohol um, paper towel or whatever and they'll wipe it off like this which is basically takes it from sterilized on the outside to sanitary on the outside but the inside is definitely still sterilized because all the heat but anyway so first I'm going to take uh, shoot some of this liquid into the shot glass here so now I've got some spores in my shot glass over here to work with oh you know what I didn't do I did not open up my my little oven tech here. This is this is oven tech. So this is like a, a steel air box. This isn't a steel air box. It's not a laminar flow hood, but it's close to laminar flow because I've got the oven at 250 and I open it up and all the hot air comes out of here and basically keeps the bad air from being in my work area when I start you know opening jars and egg air plates and everything else. So now I've got hot flow coming up through here. And this is basically how I do everything is is going to be uh, on this oven tech uh, kind of laminar flow hood. So either way, so I poured some of the spore liquid in there. And I'm going to use this for the air plates. But first, I'm going to use the rest of this uh, syringe here. Not the rest of the syringe. All you need is like one or two cc's of the, uh, the liquid. And I take my jar and I open it up. And basically, all I'm going to do is put in a little bit, like... You know, once you see there, once you see over on this side, and then put the lid back on as quick as I can. Don't tighten it up all the way. Just kind of leave it loose. Put my lid back on there. And that jar is inoculated. So I'll basically stow this away in a cabinet and then wait for it to start growing with mycelium. So that's that done. Here's the first agar plate I'm going to use. It's just from straight from the syringe. And just gonna go one drop right in the middle of it there. Bloop. Oh, that was a splash. Well, that's not gonna work very good, but either way, it'll be over in the corner when it gets done going. So that's the first one is from this uh, syringe, straight from the syringe. The next one I'm gonna do <clears throat> is from the liquid over here with my uh, inoculation loop. This is an inoculation loop, basically it's a little loop you can get something on to wipe it basically straight on the agar plate, however you want to do it. Let me get this out of the heat now and close it. Oops. So I've got my inoculation loop here. I need to flame sterilize that as well. Go until it's red hot. I'm going to cool it down on the water over here. <laughs> Probably isn't the best way to do it, but that's what's happening. Shoot. I'm going to go scrape some of these little spores off here. A couple little spores in the water. Try and scrape a couple of them on the actual loop here. Just to make sure I got something to get work with to put on the agar. So now this loop has some of this on it. Take my next dish here and do a little swirling kind of Z pattern through here. And that is the second dish inoculated. Or second agar plate that is. And the third one, I'm going to go straight from a spore print. So this is what you'll get from a buddy or somebody that's grown your uh your um grown your strain of mushroom before and that's a spore print this is a little weird one my buddy did this is the deer caps spore print and one more i'm gonna flame sterilize this thing until it's all the way hot which it is all the way hot i'm gonna take it i'm gonna cool it off in the agar actually
There. Now that's cooled off. I'm just going to take some of this spores directly off here and scrape it straight onto the egg air plate. And there they are. So you can see the spores going there. There. Don't have to be a lot, this has to be some. Okay, there's that. That's pulled back up. That's over here. Here's the agar plate that I just put those spores print spores you can see on there. You don't need anything. Basically, that's a ton of spores there, and just a little, you know, specks you can see that I put on there. So I'm closing that last one up. And that is as easy as it is to inoculate things from a spore. Uh, generally, I've had really good luck with just inoculating straight from the syringes into the grain jars. But the guys who are really serious about this uh, mycology, they almost always go to agar. And uh, here in the next section, I'm going to show you why. Basically, agar is... It's a really useful tool and medium to use to clean up your your spores. Basically, from when you come from spores, it's usually a lot of contamination involved, or it's the, one of the highest chances of contamination, just because it's you know it's just spores. It's been around. It's, it's not just completely sterilized. It's it's a uh, it's had the most chances of contamination. So the the hardcore guys usually they take the spore and they go to agar so they can clean up the agar plates as they go. And I'm going to be back in a second. When I'm uh, next, next portion of this is going to be agar plates. Basically, making agar and uh, pressure shaking, sterilizing everything, and then doing transfers and showing how you clean up your plates and uh, kind of get yourself your best shot at uh, real strong growth. That, you know, basically can carry on in your the, the rest of your grow to your um, fruiting chambers. So either way, back in a second with the uh, agar section. Okay, I'm back, and it is time to do, well, it's time to make some agar. So, I guess a lot of people don't like to make their own agar, even though it's super simple to do. Uh, this is the, this is a pretty common formula here for agar. This is a 3 2 one um, formula, so it's, to make this kind of agar, which is, like I said, it's simple. There's a, there's malt extract, and this one's a potato-based but it's uh, three grams of these mashed potato flakes to two grams of agar agar to one gram of corn syrup to a half a cup of water. So those are the ratios and you can just add up and make, make it a bigger batch or you know whatever. But I'm gonna make three times that, so I'm gonna do nine grams of the potatoes, six grams of the agar and three grams of the corn syrup with a cup and a half of water and that's going to make my my uh, agar solution here before I go forward and, and pressure cook but you'll notice my hands don't have anything on them there's no gloves here I haven't sanitized any of this stuff the sanitization doesn't matter at this point because everything I'm doing here is going to go in the pressure cooker here in a second and that's where the sterilization is going to take place so uh, and something like this where it comes to preparing agar, or preparing grain jars, or anything like that that's going to go in the pressure cooker, this is the one part of mycology where it doesn't matter if you're sterile at all because you're about to dump all the stuff in the sterile, you know, in, in, the, uh, in the pressure cooker, and it's going to clean it all up for you. But either way, so agar, it's basically the, the, one of the most versatile tools of mycology just because you can... You know what I said, like basically you start the mycelium and you get it going. You can get it going on agar, but also agar, use agar to clean it up. So you can take a, a dirty, a dirty uh, agar culture and kind of cut out the clean parts and put them on a new agar plate and then grow all clean from there. Or you find the best growth, the best, the best uh, rhizomorphic growth pattern on your agar plate. You cut that off and you transfer it to a bunch of other agar plates so you only have that real nice, strong, fast rhizomorphic growth and you kind of propagate that before you go to grain jars. And so you get the, the best possible mycelium before you go any further. That's what you can use agar for, as well as you can use them for culture slants. And this is a culture slant right here, which is a way to store your, uh, store your mycelium, store your culture for a lot longer period of time than just on a regular agar plate. But anyway, let's go ahead and start making this. 
Um, like I said, it was three to two to one. I'm gonna make it nine to six to three to a cup and a half of water. So start by tearing my scale here to my beaker that's gonna be on. Blank tear. So that's zero now. Go ahead and get my spoon and I'm putting in nine grams of potato flakes. Joink. One cup is about two and a half grams, or one spoonful, excuse me. So we've got three and a half spoons. Made a mess. Alright, so be about maybe four. Ah, make a mess. So that's nine point that's nine point three grams of potato flakes there. Now I just tear it again and I'll put in six grams of agar. Or just over six grams somewhere in there. Oh, I hope I have six grams left in this package. I might not. Oh, I'm almost there. Almost. Oops, one over. Okay, six point seven. So these these things don't have to be perfectly precise. I put in nine point three of the potato flakes. I put in six point seven of the agar, and now I'm going to put in around three of the corn syrup. So I like to get the corn syrup in the middle so it doesn't stick on the sides of this jar before I pour it in somewhere. So I tear it again, like I said. So now back to zero. I'm putting in three grams of corn syrup. One. There's one. There's two. And there's 3.4. That's pretty close. That wasn't bad. So now I've got my, my uh, stuff mixed up here. I'm going to pour my cup and a half of water. I use distilled water for all this stuff. I don't know if it's necessary, but... I try and start with as clean a stuff as I can. See, I have my uh, my corn syrup in there, but I, I like to shake it around so the corn syrup gets coated with the, the other stuff, so that there's not a problem as far as sticking on my my beaker. I don't want to pour it out. This where I have a clean beaker when I'm done here. So that's done. Oh, here's the other thing. I have uh, some uh, liquid food coloring, which is not necessary, but I like it just because it makes the agar dishes look nice and cleaner. Like this, see this nice blue? That's basically what I'm gonna make these. So I got that, I'm going to basically just bring it to a boil, there, it's all in the solution, I'm going to stir it and bring it to a boil, while I'm stirring it, well, stir it while I'm bringing it to a boil that is, rinse out my beaker real quick because I'm going to use this to pour the, uh, to pour the agar back into and pressure cook it in this beaker actually. So now it's boiling, or it's getting boiling, where did my spoon go, where did I put my spoon, that's unfortunate, oh, here it is. Okay, so I got my spoon, and I got my agar recipe going now on the sink here. Go ahead and turn this a little bit closer to where I'm looking here. And basically with this uh, boiling it, you basically just go until it starts boiling. You just want it hot enough where everything is mixed together well, and it all kind of sticks together. Um, as far as these three ingredients, the potato flakes, those are basically just starch. It's basically straight carbohydrates for the, uh, for the mix here. The agar, agar powder is a gelatin. It, it's a thickening agent, so that's what makes it kind of gel. Uh, the agar itself is a, it's a, um, what is it, polysaccharide, uh, they basically extraction from a, a red algae cell walls is what agar, agar is. And I, and I pronounce it agar, some people call it agar. I'm from the south, so agar sounds better to me. If you really want to know how it's pronounced, go to, I guess, go to Malaysia and ask somebody in Malay how they say jelly, because that's where the word agar agar comes from, is uh, the Malaysian word for jelly. So, like I said, the, the agar powder is the uh, jelly agent, and then the uh, corn syrup is just straight uh, food for the uh, mycelium or bacteria, or whatever you're trying to grow. So those are the three components. Um, as far as the water goes, like I said, you do Three, two, one to a half a cup of water. If you want to air high or low, you want to air on the low side. So if you put in too much water, you're gonna have like little water and stuff running. Like, you know, you'll see water just dripping up and down your culture slants or your agar plates. It's, it's better to air on the low side or just be right on the money than uh, end up with too much water in there. This thing is getting pretty close to boiling here, so it won't be long until I have it and then be able to pour it into my beaker here. And then it'll be time to get everything ready for the pressure cooker. The pressure cooker right now, I've got it heating up already on the um, stove here. Because this stove, I guess it's not strong enough for this pressure, but it, it takes forever to get this pressure cooker up to temperature. 
And I think maybe I put in too much water. That's very. That's also very. <laughs> it's also a very strong possibility that I put in too much water in the pressure cooker. So that's why it takes mine so long to get uh, boiling and uh, up to the right pressure. But that's all right. I'd rather have too much water in there than have it run out of water in the process and tear things up. So we're almost there as far as heating this, uh, heating my agar up here, but it's definitely coming together real nice. Since I'm heating it up a little slower than usual, hopefully it's not gonna stick on the bottom of the pan. When I have it like hot right away, when I put it in hot water, uh, or when I put the mix into hot water, it kind of gels up a little faster on the bottom and sticks a little more. Actually, it's starting to stick now, but either way, we're getting going, it's about to start boiling. And as soon as it starts boiling, basically, I can pour it in there and get on with this this uh, situation here. But uh, here it goes. I'll, I'm going to let the foam come all the way up, and I'll just pour it out, and we'll be done with this. Here it comes. Here it comes. There it comes. Okay, let me turn that off. Keep stirring here. Let it boil up a little smidge more. Good enough. All right, so that is boiled. Agar boils real foamy, that's for sure. So either way, there's that. I'm gonna pour it straight in my beaker because the beaker is one I'm gonna be using for the pressurization process. Other people use little uh, little jars with lids. I like beaker with a uh, a beaker with uh, just some aluminum foil on top. It works really good for me. So let me keep stirring this before it gets too congealed up here. So here's my little uh, food coloring that I was talking about using. This just it's not necessary, but it makes the plates look neat. Oh no! Okay, I've fixed that and now. I just dropped a little, little, uh, little ring off my food color and just fell on the agar. That was unfortunate. Let me get that out of there before I mix it up. Okay, so that's going in the sink. Alright. Mix it up. There we go. There's the color my agar plates are going to be. Which I like that. The blue color is awesome. Some people don't like the color, so they, they like to be able to look all the way through the agar and see through the plates and whatever, but I like blue, and the other neat thing about a colored agar plate is, if you've had mycelium on the agar for a long time, it actually eats the color out too. So the mycelium will make the color back to back to like a, a clear or just a milky color again, rather than leaving the blue in there. So anyway, this right here is made agar. It is ready to go in the pressure cooker. But before I put it in the pressure cooker, I'm going to go ahead and prepare some culture slants, because I need some of those. Um, I prepare the culture slants before they go in the um, before it goes in the pressure cooker. Because I, I pressure cook the culture slants as they are. Uh, I pour the agar plates after the uh, pressure cooker, so I'm pouring them into the plastic ketchup cups. But thus far, I've had no problems with contamination from those plastic ketchup cups. They've been working really good. So either way, let me go ahead and fill up some of these culture slants. These are uh, centrifugal uh, slants. Uh, I'm not sure what is the exact tournaments for these but they're uh they're these little uh kind of test tubes that scientists put in this uh, these little centrifugal spinners but either way they work great for culture slants and there's like a 50 these are what this is a 50 milliliter one and this is a 15 milliliter one and they're both you know i don't know that's, that's just what they are so let me go ahead and get these ready here and i'm going to use this little uh plunger here to Fill these up. All right, those are all done. Get that. Get this. We'll see how much goes in here. What the right amount is. I, I forget how much I'm supposed to put in these. I I did it once before, but either way, let me go ahead and fill it up. See how much we need here. Actually, it looks like it needs a bunch. Let's see. Any more? That's about a good amount right there. Okay, that'll work. So that's about the right amount for a culture slant. Put the lid on that one. So I was talking before about what culture slants are good for. Culture slants are awesome because they uh, they will preserve your culture a lot longer than a agar plate. Mainly because it's got a lot more. Um, there's a lot more nutrients inside the culture slant for the um, mycelium to be able to feed off of. Whereas a, a, a petri dish or an agar plate is real 
uh, shallow all the way across. The culture slate like this has this little reservoir of nutrients down underneath here. So the the uh, mycelium will be able to feed off this for a very long time, almost almost indefinitely, especially if you put it in the refrigerator. They'll they'll be able to feed off this a long time. So either way, I'm I'm filling these up the right amount here, and I'm loosening the lid before I put them in the pressure cooker so that the obviously the steam can get inside there and uh, you know pressure cook it or sterilize it that is it's always a little tricky trying to figure out how much to put in these slants especially the small ones it's real hard to tell how full they are that's about right and this agar is starting to cool down so it is getting a little trickier even but let me get the last one done here that'll work just right all right so there we go there's all my culture slants I'm just making four of those because I don't really need a whole lot. I really don't need more than one or two per uh, strain, but I like to just look. I always make a little extra when I make things. But anyway, that's that's basically the whole combining, combining things to make the agar. And now I'm going to put everything in the pressure cooker. So I took this syringe apart, still got agar on it, whatever. I'm gonna go ahead and sterilize this in there as well while I'm pressure cooking everything else. And I, if you wanna sterilize other things besides the agar and grain, or whatever, you just kinda of throw it in some foil and wrap it up and that's it, good to go. So I'm gonna dump that in there before I, that's hot. Dump that in the pressure cooker before I deal with the other stuff. Now I'm gonna go ahead and put the lid on this. And like I said, the culture slants are all loosened. The uh, the lid on each one of these culture slants. Oh, I forgot to put water in here. So it's better to have water, at least some water, in the bottom of any glass jar you have in a pressure cooker. Because allegedly they can crack if you don't have some in there. And also it'll help for the steam here on the uh, um, cooking these culture slants. But someone said, I don't know if I trust or not, but they said that... Uh, if you don't have water in your jars, they can they can crack if you have them and they're just empty. Anyway, there's that. And now I just have to put the lid, or sorry, the uh, foil on my agar here that I just mixed up. And I'm throwing it in here in the pressure cooker as well. So the pressure cooker is heating up. It's still going to take a while for those pressure cookers all the way ready. Well, you know what? Actually, that's not bad. That's some decent steam going, so it wouldn't take too long for this to heat up now. I've had it going pretty good. But um, the other thing people use, kind of like agar, to basically make mycelium grow real fast and be able to spread it and whatever, they use liquid culture, which it's kind of similar to agar, except it's, it's 3D instead of 2D. So in the liquid culture, the, the mycelium can spread out any direction, like all the directions through the liquid, rather than across the top of an of a, of a, uh, agar plate. So it spreads a lot faster, and you can see through it, it's a little harder to figure out what's contaminated and what's not. And also, it's not as like versatile as far as just like being able to isolate and, and spread things um, to different agar plates. But it is easier to keep sterile because you can just use an injection port on top of a lid on a jar and just use a, a, a sterile syringe to get liquid culture, you know, out of there and transfer it wherever. So liquid culture is kind of like agar except for it's, it, it colonizes a lot faster. And um, it's, it's easier to use for those like, huge operations if you want a lot of mycelia culture to be able to spread to other things. And also it keeps it sterile. But uh, I don't mess with liquid culture. If you wanted to do liquid culture, you basically just do 5% um, of corn syrup or honey or whatever to water. And then you pressure cook it just like the agar you're pressure cooking here for 30 minutes at 15 PSI. And it's basically the same thing as done at that point. So now I'm just waiting for this thing to heat up. Um, what else are we gonna talk about about agar? Oh, let me look. As long as I'm got my dirty hands, I'm gonna be back in a second. I forget I'm pouring these um, pouring these uh, agar plates. Or once it's done pressure cooking, I'm gonna come back and pour some of the agar plates. But just showing you one of the agar plates. This is one that's this is one that didn't work out right. So this is this is how easy contaminant or contaminated. Uh, culture is the spot on agar you can see this is just gray 
nasty garbage on this agar plate, which is this is going in the trash. I don't even like there's no there's no good stuff at all on this agar plate. But when you start messing with agar, say I had, say I'd colonized this plate, and one side of it was clean and white and nice rhizomorphic growth. And in one side had a little this this uh, gray blotch of mold on it. So the beauty of agar is you can take that. Say we're just we're gonna imagine this little, this little blotch is just on one side, and the other side of this whole thing is colonized, nice white growth. So the beauty of agar is I can just take another clean plate or a couple more clean plates, and just cut the forward edge of the uh, the clean growth off and put it on the new plate, and, and preserve my culture without just tossing the whole thing once it gets contaminated. So that's that's one of the uh, the upsides of this stuff. But there it is, this is like it, like I said, it's basically a jelly. And here's here's what it is when it's you know done. And this is going in the trash right now, so I figured I'd just take it out and show you what and this is a really thick egg plate too. I guess I poured that one kind of deep, but point is this is this is what it looks like when it gets ruined. That's what contamination look like. Contamination coming basically uh not even on the screen, yeah. Contamination can come in basically any color, like uh green Green and gray are probably the, the most common colors in contamination. But there's pink, yellow, orange, you know, rust color, anything else. But uh, green, usually they call it trike. Uh, but, you know, green and gray you're going to see the most when it comes to contamination. But if you maintain most of your practices right, then you shouldn't have too much contamination. But uh, even if you do, if you use agar, it should be easy to not worry about and just make another plate and take the good stuff and continue the good parts of the culture and make it really strong air plates and then you'll be a lot better off when you get to uh, transferring the grain jars with the good stuff and then those grain jars onto the uh, the your mono tubs but anyway I got a long time I get like I said I'm gonna cook this for 30 minutes in the pressure cooker at 30 psi I'll be back in a second when I'm done with the pressure cooking of it okay now we're back and this agar has been pressure cooked in the pressure cooker I think I said 30 psi at the end of the last video I meant at 15 psi for 30 minutes I took the culture slants out and they're still liquid right now very runny liquid at this point because they're still hot so basically just prop those up on something that makes it where you got a slant there. So you got the reservoir, you got the huge surface area for the slant. Basically you just want them at an angle something like that. So either way, got those on their slant and those are cooling down now. I, obviously I tightened up the lid before I did that. But now it's time to start working on the rest of this stuff. Pouring the agar plates. So... To pour the agar plates, I got these. This is the one thing that's not sterile here, is the uh, ketchup dishes. You want to wait till basically your agar is down below 140, and it is just getting below that right now. It's at 140 right now, so below 140, it gets comfortable to touch, not too crazy to touch anymore. So you can do it. I'm using the oven tech. So now, now that we've got this, uh, now that we've got everything pressure. You know, sterilized. It has. I have to keep everything clean now. So I've got to put alcohol on my hands, wearing gloves, and wipe everything down. I already wiped everything down, but I'm gonna go ahead and do my hands again before I start here. But uh, so once it comes out of the pressure cooker, everything needs to be very sterile, as sterile as you can keep it. So we got our hands washed down. I've got my oven tech going here. The oven's at 250. Now I open this up, and heat comes out. The air from the oven is basically sterilized, sanitary at, at least. So the air is coming out hot. It's got a flow coming up through the grate here I'm working on. So it keeps the bad contaminants from falling down on these plates that I'm working on. And that is how the oven tech works. And the oven tech is my only thing I use. I don't use a still air box or a laminar flow hood because I just don't, I mean I could make a still air box pretty easy with a tub, but I don't, I, I'm just not going to, ever. <laughs> as long as I have this oven tech, it's hot, it's definitely hot to sit here and work with this, you know, 250 degree air blowing in your face, but it's worth it. 
So that guy's ready. Kind of swirl around, make sure it's not you know settling out down the bottom. Different. There's different little uh, layers. If you let it settle down, it, it kind of settles out a little different. But it's pretty mixed up now. Well, so here we go. I'm gonna go ahead and start pouring some of these cups. It is actually pretty hot on the hands, but whatever. You know, if you've ever grilled or barbecued or anything like that, you probably got some a little bit of hand, you know, toughness built up. So basically, this fills up. Try and keep them a little bit, not super deep. Like that one I had contaminated I showed earlier was really a deep pour, but these are all, oops, these are all pretty shallow cups I'm trying to pour here. I'm probably gonna end up with about ten of them. That's basically all. Just pour those in, and one of the tricks to making sure you do get get these lids on here is keeping the lids off to the side. If the lids get hot then the lids are really hard to pop on the top here. So if you keep the lids cool while you're doing this, kind of keep the lids out of the oven tech area. If the lids are in the oven tech area that I'm using, or working on, then they get kind of, uh, so this is giving me problems like that. It gets kind of tricky clicking them on there. So right now, this whole thing is really, it click, the first one clicked on so easy. The second one is giving me a lot of trouble. Okay, I'm gonna come back to that one. It's definitely too, uh, I guess the, the cup got a little too soft, so when the cup gets bendy, it's hard to click them on. One or the other gets too tough and it's hard to click it on there. So same thing with this one, it might be too tough as well. Unless I can get it on there, get on there, get on there, get on there. Oh my goodness. Okay, whew, that one went on. All right, let's see if I can get the rest of these up. Without too much trouble here. The first one clicked on so easy, and the second one, third one, tough. This one was easy. By the way, that's basically all I'm doing to put these agar to make these agar plates. It's just pour it and oops, that's not on there either. Oh, it's on there. It's on there. So pour it and just throw the the uh, lids on, and that's it. So once these cool down, these will be ready to transfer. Do whatever kind of transfers you want to do to them. And here in a second, I'm going to show you kind of a couple of examples of how agar is used, but uh, how versatile it is. And basically, it's uh, any any source of mycelium you can find. You can basically throw it on your the middle of your agar, oh, throw it on the middle of your agar plate here, and just kind of propagate it. Oh man, some of them I get lucky, and some of them just are so hard. All right, I'm gonna set that aside too. Try to get the last one here. Okay, last one went on easy. So, some of these go on really hard and some of them go on really easy, apparently. Obviously. But, there we go. Got three more cups here. This thing's cooling down. Uh, I, I'm sure I mentioned it, but yeah, 140 degrees is, you kinda wanna get under that before you start pouring these out because you can melt these little plastic cups if it's a uh, higher temperature than that, that's, you know what, let's see how those things, that's kind of thin. Let me go ahead and just call that a wrap and just pour the rest of this out here. That's how easy it is to make these uh, agar plates. So I'm going to keep twirling and try and get these lids on here. Actually, I'm a couple lids short. But uh, keep trying to get these lids on here. And I'll be back in a second when I've got all the lids on. Oh, that one on there now. Uh, cooled off a little bit. When they cool off a little bit, it gets a little more rigid and it's easier to put the lids on. So, so I set those aside. There we go. The, the tough ones were, got on there finally. But I gotta go get lids for these two. Anyway, I'll be back in a second. I'm done with all these. And then I'll show you examples of how to use these agar plates. Transferring things to grain, transferring grain back to agar, transferring from agar to agar. Basically expanding your culture, expanding your culture. Agar is a great way to do that. So I'll be back in a second and show you what else these things do. Okay, it took me a second, but I got all those lids on the containers. One thing I didn't mention when I was making these is that a lot of times there's this condensation on the top of the lid which makes it hard to see into. But one way, basically, the way to deal with that is to stack these up and somehow I guess the heat or whatever it is from the hot ones, it, it makes it where the condensation doesn't form on the, uh, the lids underneath there. So the top one has condensation on it but the rest of them, lid, the condensation doesn't form there. The other thing you can do I think which 
a lot of people do is just flip these things upside down once they're cooled off enough to gel. But uh, that's good enough for me. I'm okay with a little bit of uh, obscured lids on a couple of them there. But anyway, here's a, here are some examples of what you can do with agar over here. I, I've got a, here's one set of agar cups. And here's the original right here. I got the, the flow open still so I can go get it. But here's the original. And you can see where I took, see the rhizomorphic, the more, most rhizomorphic growths over here on the side. You can see the little thread-like stuff on the bottom here. And I cut all my little, my little uh, transfers out of those areas where the rhizomorphic growth, it's already growing back over it. But out of this cup, with these five transfers, this is how you can spread it. I took this one cup and I spread it, each little chunk, to a different, oops, to a different cup here. So this one's growing out. That one's growing out, and they're all growing out really good. Rhizomorphic growth here, it looks like. This one's hard to see, but same thing. Here's a really clean one, a really solid. I mean, if I, if I really wanted to purify this, uh, you know, a bunch of agar cups, I would just take this one, but all these right here are going to go to grain jars. They're pretty similar, pretty homogenous as far as the uh, sample. But that's, these all came from this one dish right here, expanded out to five dishes. So that's basically how you can, like, spread your fire when it comes to the mycelium, what I was talking about with the, you know, manipulating mycelium. There's... There's one use of the uh, agar is basically just to expand your culture, and and here's here's the other way I used it. I took uh, the grain jar I inoculated. I basically ended up with only one grain jar, which is not enough to put to bulk. So rather than trying to go grain to grain or anything like that, I took grains out of that grain jar and I just threw them back in the middle of these these agar plates, just threw a little grain, an inoculated grain, a mycelium good growth, threw a little piece of grain in each one of these dishes, and now I've got that same strain growing back on agar. So you can take your mycelium, and the beauty of agar is you can, you don't, you never, you can always go back. You know, when, when you're in agar and, you know, anytime you have mycelium, you can always take it off of anything and go back. Same thing with uh, even once you're done growing out the culture and making mushrooms with it, you can cut in the inside of a mushroom, cut a little chunk of the tissue off the mushroom, and you drop it in the middle of an agar plate like this, and it'll do the same thing. It'll grow out that exact mycelium from the inside of the tissue of the mushroom. It'll grow that out on the agar plate you drop it on. Basically, just drop it on the middle. Basically, any kind of any source of mycelium culture. You can just drop it on the middle of your agar plate and it'll start growing sooner or later. As long as your agar is right and your contaminate your uh, your mycelium culture isn't contaminated, it's gonna do good. So either way, I like I said, I took that one jar, the grains out of it, put them back in here, and boom, now I got I'm probably gonna make six jars from these. Once these get colonized all the way, chop them up, have six grain jars to throw them in. So that's the uh, another way to use agar plates, but those, that's just expanding them. Like I mentioned before. The way that people really like to use them is to take their their culture and make sure it's not contaminated and get the strongest growth out of it. So, taking the plate and, like I said, showed you the uh, the the branching looking mycelial growth. That's what people try and do. The the real serious hardcore guys, they make sure it's not contaminated and they get their strongest growth and they isolate their strongest growth, cut out a little patch, transfer it into a you know a few other ones, and basically go for the the strongest mycelial growth. And that's all they want to put to bulk. So, they don't, or that's all they want to put to their grain jars. They don't want to take any chances on just some like random, like healthy growth. They want they want the best, the best, the best. So these guys spend a lot of time going in circles with their with their agar, little iterations of T1, T2, whatever, getting to their their best growth and their strongest, most you know homogeneous, great, aggressive, rhizomorphic growth is what they're what they're looking for. So that's what you use agar for. Also, so either way. That is agar in a nutshell, and uh, it's super easy to do. I guess a lot of people are intimidated with this agar, but the uh, point is, once you do it once, it's something you're just going to, I mean, this took me not even an hour for the whole process, which the majority of that was just waiting for this pressure cooker to do the 30 minute, you know, heat up and do the 30 minutes of uh, 15 PSI. But either way, um, I'll be back once those, the five plates up there that I got that have the good mycelial growth on them. Once I've got those all the way colonized, those are my deer caps, by the way. Once I got those all the way colonized, 
I will be coming back to make my grain jars, build my mono tub, and then I will be doing the uh, making CBG bulk, so uh, coir, vermiculite, and um, gypsum uh, for the bulk substrate. And I'll be then basically uh, putting them in my bin and, and and growing it out. So anyway, I'll be back in a sec. Well, it'll be a while for me because I still have to wait. I'm going to wait till those um, plates for the transfer of the grain, those deer cap plates, get um, super, you know, all the way out to the edges before I go ahead and uh, put them to grain. So it'll be a while for me, but for you, it's coming up right now. Okay, I'm back, and it feels like it's been forever, but it's only been a couple weeks. But it's been long enough for these uh, mycelium plates that I made the, from the, the single transfer there to finally get out to the edges and fully colonize. This one, you can see the, the mycelium going up the sides there. So, yeah, they're definitely all about ready to go transfer to grain now. So, in order to transfer them to grain, I need to make some grain jars. These are what I'm going to use for the, for the jars. These are one pint jars, mason jars it is. And here's, this is wild bird seed. So I'm going to use wild bird seed for the grain. Um, this is the grain that I choose because it is tiny little pieces of grain. Obviously there's some sunflower seeds in here. These are all going to come out. Um, but either way, so I got the uh, water heating up here. I'm going to dump my grain in here. And I'm going to use, I'm planning on making five jars, five of these grain jars. So while I'm measuring it out, I'm measuring out about two and a half jars worth of grain. Actually a little bit over that, but the point is this stuff about doubles when you're, when you are uh, boiling it, it basically about doubles. So. I put about just over two and a half jars of grain there because I'm planning on making five grain jars. And now, while this is getting ready to boil, while it's boiling, I'm basically just going to go in here and get rid of these sunflower seeds, which I don't think is necessary to get rid of the sunflower seeds, but I'm going to do it just to uh, get them cleaned out of there and make it, you know, a little more homogenous of a blend here. But, uh, or, or basically just get the sunflower seeds on it. Sunflower seeds don't really work as a, uh, it, it's not fuel for the, for the mycelium. It's not something they can eat. So leave the grain in there, which is their food, and take out the sunflower seeds. But um, I chose bird seed because it is the, uh, it's the smallest grain size of, it, of all my options. So you can you can use all kinds of stuff like popcorn, popcorn, uh, oats, uh, wild bird seed. Obviously, millet is one of the things in wild bird seed. But uh, either way, there's there's a ton of different kinds of grain you can use. But I use this one because it's the smallest grain size. And the reason I want the smallest grain size is because well, where'd that guy come from? I want the smallest grain size because it's uh, it will inoc the it'll have the uh, the most inoculation points for the same volume of of uh, grain. So, say I take a jar of huge grain sizes and I dump them into bulk, it'll have a lot less inoculation points, so it'll take a lot longer to colonize fully the uh, the the monotub. And the smaller the grain is, the more inoculation points there are, so the quicker it colonizes the bulk substrate from the smaller the grain is. So either way, that's a, I described that poorly or explained that poorly, but that's why I like the, the bird seed because it's a small grain size. And I'm getting out all the, trying to take out the, uh, the sunflower seeds here and leave everything else, but uh, it's, I'm not doing a great job. But I got about all the sunflower seeds out of here. Um, so right now I'm boiling this. I'm going to bring it to a boil and let it boil for 30 minutes. And so what we're doing here is, there, there, you can also just soak it overnight. There's guys who soak it overnight and do whatever other methods. But this is the uh, the boiling method gets the 
the moisture inside the grains the fastest. And that's the whole point of this right now is we're trying to get the moisture inside this grain to the right amount. So once, once these grains have boiled for about 30 minutes, they'll have the correct amount of moisture, or water content in them, to work for the, uh, for the, in the grain jars, for, for the, uh, my son to have everything needs as far as water and uh, food. But either way, that's pretty cleaned out as far as the sunflower seeds go. Here's what I got, just a jar of bird, wild bird seed. And I'm basically gonna let this boil for 30 minutes. And once it's done boiling for 30 minutes, I'm gonna come back and do the rest. But like I said, the whole purpose of this, boiling or dealing with the, uh, the bird seed or grain or whatever, before it goes to jars, the whole point of this is to get the correct amount of moisture in the grains. So I'll be back in about 30 minutes or however long it takes to boil this. And I'll show you what I do next. Okay, I took these grains out of the, uh, sorry, I, after I got them boiling about 30 minutes, I strained the grains and I put them on these drying pans here. They've been sitting here for about an hour. And the whole point is just to leave them out in the air so they dry out on the outside of the grain. Obviously the, the moisture is already in the inside of the grain. The outside of the grain is what we're trying to get to the right moisture level. So the way to test if it's the right moisture level, this is from Philly Golden Teacher's channel, but basically just take some grain, dump it on a little brownish paper towel, makes it easier to see, but dump it on there, and dump it back, and that's about what you want to see. No like pulled up water, but just a little, little kind of specks of water on there is just about right. So either way, this stuff is dried out to the right amount. So now that it's dried out to the right amount, I'm going to take these jars, the pint mason jars that I have, and I'm going to use them like this. We're going to flip around the tops. Well, obviously I'm going to fill up the jars first, but the tops are going to be flipped around so there's going to be air to be able to come in there when I'm pressure cooking. But here's how full we want to get this. We want to get it not all the way full. We want to get it probably like a five sixths full, something like that. Want a little bit of room on the top so you can shake up your grains. Once, uh, once you get it a little bit colonized, like uh, well, actually, I'm inoculating these grain jars with agar, so I'll have to shake them up when I first put the agar in there. Then I'll shake them up again when I put. Uh, when, sorry, when they're about a third of the way colonized, I'll shake them up again. Colonize fast. But that's about how full I want these. So there's a, a decent amount of uh, space to shake around the, uh, the grains. Like I said, I'm using the unmodified lid tech, so just an upside down, turn the lid upside down. Don't tighten it up all the way. I'm gonna leave it like that. I'm gonna put a piece of foil over the top, like this. I'm gonna do this on all of these grain jars. And like I said, make sure, make sure the lid is loose not closed all the way, make sure it's loose like this so there's air able to go in there when it's getting steam, or sorry, not steam, when it's getting pressure sterilized. And that's it. So all I have to do is load up my other four jars here. And once I get these all loaded up, I'm going to put them in the pressure cooker for 90 minutes at 15 PSI as well. Pressure cook these for. Once that 90 minutes is over, I will turn off the pressure cooker and then I'll just basically let it cool down and let it sit overnight inside the pressure cooker. And then tomorrow I will be taking and inoculating all these jars with the um, agar plates that are fully colonized up there. So that's what's happening. That's basically making these grain jars in a nutshell. And uh, yeah, like I said, I'm gonna pressure cook them for 90 minutes, 50 per side, and I'll be back tomorrow when everything's ready. And we'll go ahead and inoculate these jars at that point and get underway with uh, the rest of this deal. Okay, I'm back and it feels like it's been forever, but it is finally time to go ahead and take these colonized agar plates. We got, I got six of them, I'm only gonna use five of these. Colonized agar plates to inoculate these grain jars that I just made yesterday. I just opened up this 
pressure cooker for the first time since I put it in there. Like I said, I did an hour and a half um, at 15 PSI. And then when the hour and a half was up, I basically just turned off the, the stove and left it sitting there under pressure and let it cool down overnight. This is the next day, about 24 hours later probably. But now all I'm going to do is take, uh, by the way, I just got done wiping down everything here. I got my got my oven tech going here, so the heat's coming up now. There's the hot air, hopefully sterile hot air coming up out of there. Actually, let me go ahead and put this out here to work in this area here. Take my first agar cup here, and what I'm going to do is basically just open this up and cut up the agar and dump it in. Um, before I do that, I need to sterilize the my little. Um, blade here so I can cut the uh, agar up in a bunch of little chunks and dump it in there. So I'll go ahead and start doing that now. Yeah, I'll do one at a time. So I get my jar here. I'll go ahead and take the lid off. I'll take I'll just stick that off for now because I'm about to have to cut this up first. So take my flame Sterilize my blade. There we go. It's nice and red. Now the problem is I don't want to uh, leave it too hot here because it'll cut straight through the the little cup here. These cups are plastic, so if I press with any kind of uh, strength, I'll cut right through the bottom of this. So I kind of want to touch it in the agar cool it off first which there we go that probably cooled it off and just take this and we're gonna slice up a little grid here and once I get my little grid sliced up get it all in a little checkerboard pattern I can go ahead and just dump it in the other I dump it in the jar here that I'm getting ready for it this stuff is thicker than I thought it would be, but yeah, it's fairly thick. Ooh, ooh, ooh. try not to cut through the bottom of this cup. This cup is not flat on the bottom, so it's kind of jerky going across the ridges on the bottom. But either way, that's that. It's cut up, and you can see you can just kind of pop it up and get the little pieces coming out of here. Get them ready. Dump in there. There, so now it should pour in there just fine. All right, so that's that. Put that back down while I take the lid off over here. I'm trying to take off the lid as little as possible. Well, I didn't get it off there as good as I thought I would. Yeah, so some of this stuck together. I didn't, wasn't able to cut all the way to... All right, there we go. There's all the pieces. Let me go ahead and put my lid back on then. And this piece right here and tighten the lid for a second and then shake it all up here so I'm trying to get the agar pieces the chunks of agar that are colonized and mix them up as much as I can in the jar here which is not that easy they're all sitting up top there I need to kind of shake oh there we go now I got them that's pretty good distribution so there we go so I got my agar in there distributed through the jar and now that is one jar inoculated. You can see the, the blue uh, agar pieces all the way through there. So that's the jar inoculated. And I'm gonna do the exact same thing with the rest of these jars and put them back up in the cabinet. But either way, that's, that's this entire process. I'm gonna do one jar at a time. I still gotta do the rest of them, but you can see it spread out through there, the little, the little agar pieces, so. I need to re-sterilize my hands, re-flame sterilize the, the razor blade, and then do all this four more times. And I'll have a uh, whole set of deer cap uh, inoculated grain jars with the agar. So there you go. I'll be back. Uh, probably it'll be about... 
It's probably going to be about a week or two. I'm basically going to wait till these till the grain jars are about 30% colonized, and I'm going to shake them up. So I'll come back when those are about 30% colonized, and I'll show you what I got, and I'll shake them up. By the way, I'm leaving the the lid on the jar. You don't keep it tight. You keep it loose, so there's a little bit of air. So there's a little bit of air being able to get in and out of there, but uh, only a little bit. So you don't keep it tight. You keep the lid on but loose. So anyway, I'll be back when these things are about 30% colonized. I'm going to go ahead and do the rest of these. You only need to see one. So I'll be back when they're about 30% colonized. I'm going to do the shake up and show you how that works and then uh, continue from there. Okay, I'm back and it's not even been a week of my deer cap jars here. These are the ones that I just got done. Well, like I said it's been almost a week now probably, but this is the agar that I put in the... Uh, you can see a couple little specks of agar, but the uh, the color, the blue color is gone now completely from the agar. But either way, these things are at least 30% colonized. I can't see if I've got this on the camera or not. So yeah, these are at least 30% colonized. And now is the time, so I just tighten the lid back up and then shake it around. So what I want to do is just get these grains that have been got mycelium growing on them and get them shaken up and spread out through the jar again that way it'll get to complete colonization and ready for uh putting it to bulk sooner that way so there it is it's all broken up the mycelium is broken up and you can't even see any white in here anymore but it's in there it's just more spread out so it should get to the rest of it faster and be completely colonized faster. So I loosened it to shake, or sorry, I tightened it up to shake it all up. Now I'm just loosening it back up to get that little, just little bit of air exchange for these jars. And then that's it. Put them back in here until they're all, look at these things. Nice clean jars. And then you see some blue there. It looks like from the, uh, a little bit of the, um, Agar still got the blue color, but for the most part, the mycelium's eating all the blue out of the agar. It's a little bit left. But either way, I'm going to do it with all five jars, shake them up good, get all the mycelium broken up, and then loosen the jar back up and stick them back in there for it to finish completely colonizing the jar. So like I said, it's been about not even, not even an entire week I don't think it took to get at least like it almost half probably colonized but at least 30% like I said loosen them up after I shake them back up and put them back in the bin to wait for the last I don't know week or so of colonizing now that they're all broken up and and spread throughout the rest of the uncolonized period. So either way that's just a little step here. This isn't even uh, necessary, really, but if, if you know if you're impatient and you want it to go faster, this is one of the things you can do to make it go faster: is to break it up and spread out all the inoculation points throughout the grain jar here, and just basically speed up the process. So either way, I'll be back once these things are all the way colonized, and it'll be time for me to transfer these this grain spawn to the bulk uh, substrate I'm going to make in the mono tub that I'm going to make so that's right either way I'll be back probably be about another week or so and, and this stuff's growing pretty fast so yeah probably about not too much more than a week if that to get these things all the way colonized and all the way white in the jars Right now they're looking good. I'm happy with the progress and how fast this is an aggressive deer caps, apparently aggressive mycelium growth. So anyway, I'll be back when it's time to put these to bulk. Okay. I didn't think I was gonna have to make this part of the video, but I have a jar here that is begging for me to make this part of the video. And it is the contaminated jar. This is the same bird seed, uh, wild bird seed mix. And it's got some mycelium in there, but it just went real, real, real bad. So, this part turned black, almost the color of soil. 
This part turned green. Some other little stuff down here. This is just, this got some green in it too. It just looks really, really, really bad. That's green there. But the black is the part that's interesting to me. But either way, this is just nasty and gnarly and not good. But that's all right. That's why I make a lot of jars instead of just one. But yeah, this one is, this is the worst jar I've ever, I've come across. But anyway, just showing you what a terrible contaminated jar looks like. And I'll be back in a second when I'm about to get the, uh, bulk substrate ready okay i'm back and it's been barely any time since i shook these jars up not even a week i don't think maybe six five six days but either way these are completely colonized now which means it is time to put these grain jars to bulk substrate so i got five grain jar or five pint jars i'm gonna make bulk substrate and i'm gonna make a monotub out of this a, a modified monotub out of this so the recipe for bulk substrate is um, it, you can find this on PGT uh, Philly Golden Teachers recipe is basically what I use, which is a uh, 650 grams of coconut coir to eight cups of vermiculite to one cup of gypsum to 18 cups of water. So you basically mix up all those dry ingredients, or you don't mix them. You just basically dump them in a, a, a bucket here. So I'm gonna put those dry ingredients in the bucket to whatever, to those same ratios. I'm actually gonna do less because I already have some made in the bucket. So I'm gonna do a 550 gram brick of a coca coir and then whatever that comes out to in a vermiculite will be like maybe seven or six and a half cups of vermiculite, maybe a three quarter cup of gypsum and then like maybe 15 cups of water. So I'll put all the dry ingredients in the bucket and then I'm basically just gonna boil up um, the cups of water till it starts boiling dump the water boiling into the bucket and that basically pasteurizes your um, bulk substrate and also gets it to the right fill capacity which is the right uh, um, basically gets it all the way saturated with water without being too much it gets it to the perfect uh, level of moisture which is basically fully saturated but not you know oversaturated so once I get this stuff and that's gonna be sitting overnight after I get done doing that right now this will be sitting overnight uh, in this bucket, basically cooling off, pasteurizing, whatever. And after I get done getting that ready tonight, I'm gonna build my monotub. So I'm using this, uh, it's a Sterilite 75 liter monotub. Whatever, it doesn't really matter the size as long as it's, you know, as big as you want it to be. I chose this one because it has a, a flat bottom on the inside. There's no real ridges in here. And also because the, the top is clear and it has these nice little handles to, to close the top. So to make this monotub, first thing I'm going to do is take out this um, gasket here. I'll take it out when I get when I start doing it. But I need to take out this rubber gasket so it's not airtight. I need a little bit of gasket change all the time through the, uh, through the lid, even before I put it into fruiting. Before I put it into fruiting, I'm going to have basically everything closed, the lid closed and everything else. But I just want to little bit of gas exchange so that the mycelium can fully colonize the bulk substrate so that needs to come out for the entire process and then over here in this tub I'm basically just going to drill two holes on each long side which are basically going to be right above the substrate here and here and then one hole on each end up at the top and so basically the way the monotub is supposed to work is you have about anywhere between two and four inches of substrate and then Above that, you have the, the holes right above the bottom. So when, uh, when uh, mushrooms grow, they breathe oxygen and they exhale CO2, just like people do. So the monotub is designed to have air come in, basically, and flow up and push the other air out of the higher hole there so you get good air exchange. It's called fresh FAE, fresh air exchange. And that's what you want a lot of once you get to fruiting. When you're in just the colonization of the bulk substrate phase, you want basically all these holes to be closed and covered. But then once it's time to fruit, you want to cover these with just micropore tape so there's uh, a lot of fresh air exchange and that way the, the uh, mushroom can fruit. But anyway, I'll come back tomorrow morning when I have the bulk substrate made and this monotub holes cut and ready to go. 
and then we'll get into uh, the liner. So I'm going to put a black liner in here. It's basically a garbage bag that goes around the bottom uh, part of the tub, and we'll talk about that when I'm doing it. So anyway, be back tomorrow morning when uh, all this is going on. Okay, I'm back. I just got done making the mono tub, and I just ended up cutting this liner. So what I did to cut this liner is uh, I basically just put a trash bag on top of here, and I cut it to fit the uh, mono tub maybe a couple inches wider and longer than the mono tub. And basically, that was. And before I did this, I sterilized the bottom mono tub with al alcohol. So now it's sterilized. I've got my liner. I'm gonna put in here inside the mono tub. And I'll talk about the mono tub, and then I'll talk about what the liner is for. So basically, just put the liner down in the mono tub, make it all even, make it where it comes up every side a few inches, so it'll basically hold all the substrate in here without, you know, letting the substrate escape the liner. It basically, it's a little. Uh, anyway, that's how I get the liner in there, just like that, nice and easy. I'll talk about the liner in a second. Here's the here's the uh, mono tub I finished. I just put like a little clear packaging tape over the holes to block the airflow. So while it's in the colonizing phase, the air needs to be blocked out of here where, where there's not too much airflow. And then once the substrate is completely colonized, I'll take off these um, packaging tapes and put on uh, this micropore tape, which will allow airflow or gas to change. That way it can get the air it needs to, to fruit better. So either way, uh, there's the holes, one on each end and two on each bottom down near the substrate. And one thing I didn't mention, or one thing I did mention actually, and I still screwed it up, was I cracked this, Sparky, get out of the way. I cracked, I, drawing, cutting holes with a hole saw on a bin like this, it's thin plastic, it's really easy to crack it. So I ended up cracking this thing. I had to put a, had to put tape on there. But anyway, it's fine now. It's just uh, another reminder. You want to go really slow when you're cutting thin plastic with a hole saw. People use like a metal can and heat it up with a uh, with a lighter, and they just melt the sides. But I use hole saws. Anyway, here is my. Bulk substrate is about to go in the bin here. And I should have gloves on, but I don't. So it's not that big of a deal at this point. Actually, it is that big of a deal. I'm gonna turn off the camera and go get some gloves and I'll get back going here in a second. All right, so I don't actually need, um, this isn't a sterile part of this situation. Once the grain jars are completely colonized, uh, sterilization sanitization isn't as big of a factor so I could do this with my bare hands like I was messing with this tub already with my bare hands I wiped out with alcohol but still it's not that big of a deal at this point how much contamination or well contamination is as big of a deal let's put that way anyway this is the bulk substrate after I dumped the water in it and let it sit overnight and fill capacity optimal fill capacity is basically when this thing holds as much water as it can hold without dripping it. so to find out optimal fill capacity what everybody does is they grab a little handful and they squeeze it and they squeeze it real hard and some drip drops come out right there like that some, a couple drops come out but it doesn't just doesn't just you know leak on its own it's basically holding the water and it's got a lot of water in it but not so much it's dripping but when you squeeze it hard a couple drips will come out and that means you're you're basically at optimal fill capacity so at this point i'm just going to start dumping this stuff into my bin and what I'm shooting for is somewhere between two and four inches uh, bit, uh, tall substrate here. So just keep putting it in. Actually, I'll go fill out the corners a little bit so it'll hold the, the liner in place what I really need to do. This liner is still just kind of sitting there. I don't tape it down or do anything stupid with it, so I need to make sure it's not going to move while I'm doing this. There we go. Got around the perimeter. I got a big... Uh, for this, this is a 70... This is a 75 liter... Ah, I just spilled it all over the place. This is a 75 liter um, container here. I've got five pint grain jars I'm going to mix in here. And for the, the, the uh, CBG, the coconut core, vermiculite, and gypsum uh, ratio, I went with the, uh, about, about around 800 grams of cocoa core and then mixed up the rest of it kind of proportionally to that and that's what I got for my uh, 
how much I'm going to need for this 75 liter bin here. Either way, so that's enough right there to get started. Uh, that's enough right there to get started uh, mixing in the grain jars. So now, I'm just going to take my grain jars and dump them all in here. And I'll be able to show you what fully colonized grain jar slash vermiculite, or sorry, fully, fully colonized grain jars, the mycelium, looks like. So let me go ahead and open up a couple of these. There we go. That'll work. All right. Here's a grain jar. Here it is. Oops. Here it is, fully colonized. Fully colonized and clean. So that's what it looks like. It's just cottony, puffy at the top. And it smells kind of sweet. It's just, it's obviously a vermiculite. Or it's not, yeah, I keep saying vermiculite. It's obviously a mycelium smell. It's a... Uh, I mean, if you never smell what my mycelium smells like, it's like, um, I mean, it is, it's mycelium. It's that smell. Like if you're out in the woods and you see a decaying log and you see some fuzzy stuff on it, some fuzzy white growth on a log, it's almost 100% my, mycelium and it's going to smell like this it's a little sweet, earthy smell. And if your grain jars are anything other than sweet and earthy, then they're probably contaminated. If there's any like sour or weird type smells or bad smells, it's probably contaminated. But these smell just like perfect mycelium. So there we go. So there's one green jar. I still gotta do four more of these and then I can mix them all up. So that's, here's another one nice and okay, see, the, the stuff was trying to jump out of the, the bin here. So nice, like cotton candy, cotton candy kind of texture on the stuff that's not attached to the green. Outside. All right. I'm trying to keep it all inside my liner here. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to dump out all these jars. And then once I get all those jars dumped out, I'm going to mix it all in with this bulk substrate. What I was saying earlier in the video when I was talking about why I chose birds, uh, sorry, wild bird seed is because it's small grains. These are really small grains, millet or whatever is in there, whatever other little grains in there. It's really small grains. So these really small grains, if you have this many grains, they're spread out more in the, uh, the bulk substrate. So there's less distance between each grain, which means this bulk substrate should colonize faster than if I was using a big, a large uh, grain size, like popcorn or something like that. There'll be less space between each, um, each grain. So it would, so there's, sorry, there'd be more space between each grain if I was using popcorn or something like that. So it would take longer to fill in those spaces between the mycelium inoculation points. But I'm almost there. One more jar and I can start breaking it up in here. This is a lot of mycelium here. It all looks good and healthy. Every jar smells good. It looks super white and super colonized. Okay. Last one. All right, there's the last nice, fluffy, fantastic jar. <laughs> Such a huge difference between this jar and the, uh, that super uh, contaminated one. I didn't bother opening the contaminated jar to smell what it smelled like, but I can guarantee it didn't smell good. It definitely didn't smell like this. This uh, fluffy, mycelium, earthy, sweet smell. There we go. All right. Here's all my jars dumped in. Now I just have to, oops, just have to mix them up as evenly as I can and put a casing layer. So the reason you use a liner uh, there's a couple reasons, but the two main reasons you use a liner is because one, it it kind of um, it kind of holds to the sides of the cake. This whole thing I'm making here with the bulk substrate and the and the um, and the inoculated grain spawn, this is called a cake, and the liner it kind of sticks to the side of the cake and holds tight to it. And that helps in a couple ways. The first way is it doesn't let any light hit the sides of the cake. So no, people are always talking about side pins. Side pins means the, uh, the mushrooms kind of grow out the side of the cake and stick against the side of the bin. And people don't want that because it's a real pain to harvest them. So the major thing, the, one of the major things the the liner does is prevent side pins. 
because it doesn't let light hit the side of the cake. It doesn't let air or anything else hit the side of the cake. The side of the cake is basically substrate, like underneath the, you know, the, the, the top. So now I got it all broken up, it's time to mix it up. And this is tricky to mix it up without making a mess around the sides of the, uh, the liner. But it is yeah. So basically getting it all mixed in here as well as I can. Okay, okay, okay. And once it's all completely mixed up, then I'm gonna start working on um, flattening it out and evening it out and um, and then I'll pat it down and get ready. But the other reason the the other reason the liner is good is because it's it shrinks with the cake. So if I left just the cake in here by itself, once the mushrooms start growing out of it, they suck all the water out of this out of this uh, substrate. So the substrate shrinks. So the cake is going to shrink off the walls of this of this uh, monotub as the mushrooms suck the water out of it and grow. Mushrooms are like 90% water. So basically, all this the whole point of the substrate is keeping enough water in here for these mushrooms to grow. And that's why you have to uh, rehydrate your, your uh, cake between flushes. But anyway, this is about mixed up. Looks like all the inoculation points are real nice and spread out. So hopefully I'll have a real even, um, even uh, colonization of this cake here. So now it's all evenly spread out. I'm gonna go ahead and pat it down, kind of even it out here. I want it the same level all the way across the same depth that is. I'm gonna also try and get a little bit, not just super loose, not really super fluffy, kind of get a little packed down. Basically, the same density as like a cake, you know, like a, like if you're baking a cake, when it comes out, it comes out kind of dense, kind of fluffy. This is gonna be kind of gently patted down all the way around to make sure the density is something like a cake. So there's that, and I gotta pat it all the way down. And the last step, after you get it all sorted out, and pat it down. Oops, okay. I'm trying to go out of my way here to make sure everything's level. All right, there we go. It's like feeling pretty, pretty nice and even all the way through here. Everything's patted down. Even the corners and the edges are patted down to even levels. So now I got it all patted down, the inoculated grain spawn, bulk substrate mixture. It's all patted out even. Now, the last step, is to take some more uh, of the bulk substrate and put it on top and make a casing layer. So I'm gonna take this last chunk of this, I'm gonna try and make maybe a about a quarter inch thick casing layer, which means basically just all across the top everywhere. So I'm gonna take this casing layer, and try and spread it as evenly as I can, which is a little tricky to make it super even, but the point is I'm gonna try and get this casing layer to completely cover the top. I don't want any of the inoculated grain seeing the light of day at this point. I want it all covered with a casing layer, which like I said, between, between a quarter inch and a half inch deep for a casing layer is good. The point is just you want to kind of cover up all the grain completely, make sure none of the grain is seeing the top yet. So there you go. it looks like it's covered. I actually need some more still. So, now it's all the way completely covered. This is a little thick of a casing layer, at least I can. Some of these spots is pretty thick, um, probably more than half inch. But we'll see. I'm gonna just try and just try and do it as well as I can. But it's hard to judge while you're doing it exactly how much you have covered. You just, I just want to make sure I got all the all the inoculated bulk substrate here, all the way covered. Get my top casing layer. Make sure it's covering everything. So anyway, there it goes. Now the casing layer is on. Between a quarter inch and an inch, or sorry, somewhere around a quarter inch to a half inch thick is the casing layer it's in there now. It's completely covering everything, all the way to the edges. And this is kind of like, it's, it's one, it's extra moisture, obviously. But the other thing is, it's, um, it, it lets the mycelium kind of gives it extra time to colonize everything fully before it makes it to the surface. And then once the surface is completely colonized, then everything is completely colonized and it's ready to fruit at that point. But uh, this this makes sure that everything is completely colonized before it uh, fruits, kind of. So anyway, that's that. The liner's in there. The monotone's ready. Everything is done. And at this point, 
all I'm doing is taking my lid. Actually, I need to clean up this junk. I got some. I accidentally got some more substrate in here. I was being messy. I'll clean up the floor later. But I don't want to tote this loose bulk substrate around anywhere else in my house. So there we go. So I'm gonna go ahead and put the lid on. And like I said before, you take make sure you take the uh, take the line the um, that gasket that's on this lid. And make sure you're taking it off. So if there's at least a little bit of air exchange coming in here, because this mycelium does need a little bit of fresh air exchange to colonize everything, the bulk substrate. Same thing with grain jars. You leave the grain jars slightly open when you're colonizing grain jars. So I'm trying to clean stuff with dirty hands. It's not the best way to do it, I guess. Anyway, so there we go. I'm gonna put this lid on now. I don't even need to click these latches. I'll just go ahead and leave those off. And this monotub is ready to go now. So now we're in the colonization phase of the monotub, getting the bulk substrate completely colonized. And this is gonna take a while, maybe a week or two or three, I'm not even sure. It'll take a while to get all the colonized. And that kind of depends on how much grain spawn per bulk substrate you use and whatever. But now this part's done. So um, now we'll basically just be waiting for this to colonize. One thing I haven't talked about yet is the temperatures of all these phases. Um, basically, the inoculation and the colonizing period, it can all be done between 60 and 75 degrees. Pretty much the entire grow from, from inoculating agar, grain, whatever, all the way through fruiting can be done between the, the temperatures of 60 and 75 degrees. Uh, you, earlier in the thing, earlier in the uh, colonization, Lower temperatures are slightly better because contamination will happen at higher temperatures. Uh, so I would say just a rough ballpark figure for all the colonization type stuff, you want to go between 60 and 70. And then for fruiting, you can bump it up to between 70 and 75. But you never really want to go too much above 70 or, you know, too much above 75 because then contamination is a lot higher of a risk. Anyway, there's your, your temperature profiles. But anyway, this thing's ready. And I'll be back now, as soon as this thing, I'll come back, you know, sporadically through this thing's colonization process to show you once the mycelium starts hitting the, the, the uh, surface of the cake there, a little bit of white will show and then it'll be more and more until it's all the way white. And then I'll change the fruiting conditions and show that. So I'll be back sporadically as this goes along. Okay, I'm back. I just got done putting those, uh, those um, grains, sorry, yeah, uh, I just got done putting the, uh, the, the deer cap uh, grains to bulk substrate in the monotub that was like a couple days ago but since I was starting to make this video series I got real interested in the rest of the you know mushroom kingdom or whatever the best of range of mushrooms and basically I uh, went online and I ordered a bunch of liquid cultures of medicinal and gourmet mushrooms I'm pretty excited to check these out these are um, I end up I ordered five of them and they sent me an extra one, so that's cool. But this is uh, premiumspores.com. But the ones I ordered are, well, the reason I ordered these is because they're all kind of a neat little, they all have a neat purpose. So I, I've always liked, liked the idea of different medicinal, um, medicinal, you know, alternative medicine type, herbal remedies, things like that. And that's what these are. These mushrooms work in a lot of different ways. So this one is turkey tail. It's a real common mushroom that grows off trees out in the woods. But this is uh, used in treating cancer. Like extracts from this are used in treating cancer and also, you know, immune system type things. That's the first one I ordered. Second one is Lion's Mane. And this is the one that I was most uh, interested in. This is a uh, kind of a cognitive function type uh, mushroom. So the extracts from this uh, basically rebuilds neural pathways in the brain, for especially for things like dementia patients, Alzheimer's disease, things like that. This stuff has kind of been shown to uh, rebuild, you know, neural pathways that, you know, kind of break down as the brain ages. But this is a real neat one, and it's supposed to taste good too, so I'm really excited to grow this one. Also, it looks really neat when it, flo when it, uh, when it um, fruits. The, all these medicinal mushrooms, they're all slightly different in their own way. This one has uh, little teeth. 
instead of gills underneath the, the cap, it's got little teeth that is where the spores come from. The, uh, the turkey tail and the, the reishi mushrooms, those both have like kind of a multi-pore surface or like a weird porous surface and that's where those spores come out of. But, uh, but either way, these are all neat. Lion's mane, like I said, this is the, uh, the cognitive function type mushroom and it's supposed to taste good as well and it, it fruits really interesting. Uh, the other one I got, let's see what else I got here. I also got uh, Cordyceps, this is Cordyceps militaris. There's another one called Cordyceps, uh, starts with an S, I forget what it was, but that's the type that grows out of insects. It'll, like The Cordyceps, uh, the one that starts with the S is different, um, kind of close, but slightly different. It, uh, it takes over ants, basically, it takes over their body and their brain, and, and they climb up a tree, and they kind of die attached to a leaf, the bottom side of a leaf, and they um, and mushrooms will grow out of their brain. So this is a real interesting one. But this one's used for this is like a a, a stamina, like a like a fitness uh, health stamina type uh, energy type uh, mushroom. You can make uh, extracts with with this for like I said that like kind of a pre workout uh, herbal remedy type deal. This one is the one they threw in for free. King Strophoria. I think it's just a, a I think this is just a um, Gourmet type mushroom. I, don't, I haven't looked it up. I need to look it up a little bit and check it out. So I'll put that aside. I don't really care about that one. And the other two are the reishi mushrooms. These are um, immune system. These are all about building up the immune system. There's two different kinds of reishi mushrooms I got here. But um, like I said, these are all the real interesting. These are all the mushrooms that were really interesting to me as the ones I ordered. I don't so much care about the string king strophoria, whatever that is, but all the, the reishi, turkey tail, lion's mane, and the cordyceps. Really interested in all those because they're just <laughs> pretty fascinating. But either way, these are all liquid cultures. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, inoculate a couple of grain jars here with some of these liquid cultures and uh, see how that goes. But either way, it's, it's a real simple process. I'm basically just going to take these open and uh, basically going to just pop the, um, the little top off there. I'm not even going to put a syringe on there. I'm just going to open it up and put a little bitty drop on the middle of my agar plates and that's it for colonizing that. Hopefully, hopefully these things didn't get burned up in the sun. These things were sitting in my mailbox. It was probably 110 degrees in the mailbox earlier. But uh, hopefully they made it out of there. I should have taken this out before I got my hands all clean, but hopefully they made it through that heat and are still viable. Spore syringes are supposed to be able to handle heat a lot better than the um, a lot better than um, li uh, liquid culture, but we'll see. Anyway, let me go ahead and start out with, let's just start with this, yeah, I'll leave that one. Let's start out with antler ratio. We'll do this one. So all I'm going to do is take this little, let me open my, open my oven tech here, get it hot, get the air blowing. All I'm going to do is take off this little cap here, Oops. and I'm just going to, of my cup and just get a little drop out of here hopefully just a little drop. I'm trying to not to make it squirt out like I did before and I got it just hanging there and if I go let me just touch it down Let's see. there we go one little drop and I put my little Lid back on there. Let's add the rishi. And we'll do the turkey tail next. Put the lid back on here. Label it. They are, I'm sure my hands are not super um, sterilized for this, but I think it's actually going to be okay. We'll see. I put a lot of faith in this uh, oven tech. There we go. Now we get a little turkey tail here. This one definitely you can see the mycelium in this syringe. I'm not sure. Let's see if I can get a good picture of it here. Close up of it in the camera here. But there's you can see the mycelium in the syringe floating around there. Hopefully there's no contamination. We'll see. Either way, let me go ahead and spin this sucker out of there. Try and get one little drop on here. The tricky part of this is just not overdoing with the drops. I don't want to accidentally squirt like I did before. Okay, there we go. One little drop of that one, the turkey tail. 
Anyway, you get the point. These are just inoculating agar dishes from a liquid culture syringe. And I'll come back hopefully before the end of this video and show you how these are all colonizing. But the point is, I wanted to get them out of these syringes as soon as I could because they spent some time with some serious heat today in my mailbox. My mailbox, metal mailbox, and it was probably 105 or 100. It was, it was hot as crap today, so I'm not sure how long they were in the mailbox, but I know that they were out there longer than I would have liked them to be. So anyway, I'll be back when I get all these colonized, and we'll see how if they colonized or if they didn't or how it worked out for me. But uh, anyway, I'll be back when that happens. Or I'll be back actually, probably when something happens with a bin, I'll be showing how the uh, bin is colonizing, and then I'll come in here and check these out while I'm at it. So I'll see you then. Okay, I'm back. And here's where I got the uh, deer caps in here after I put the uh, grain spawn to bulk. They've been in there for, they've been in this bin for four days. And you see through the lid, there's plenty of uh, humidity in here. Basically 90 something percent humidity. Uh, condensation all over the walls and the lid, red lid. But here's the, in about four days, the grain is almost colonized the sucker up. It's getting to up to the top here. It's gotten through the casing layer that is. And you see the rhizomorphic growth up the top there. It's mycelium everywhere. So now I'm just waiting for it to all fill in. It actually looks like there's some primordia forming over here already, but uh, there shouldn't be. Or, you know, hopefully those will just chill for a little bit and wait for this, uh, the uh, surface completely colonized and be uh, all the way white. So I want the mycelium to cover the entire, uh, the entire surface of this before I switch to fruiting conditions. Like right now, I'm just in the uh, colonization conditions where I've got these sealed, all the holes are sealed, the top's shut, and I'm not letting any air in. I'm not turning on light. So here, as soon as the top, I'll come back as soon as the uh, the top layer is all the way colonized, and I'll show you what I do to switch to fruiting conditions, and then that'll be it. But these are these stay in the dark in here. It's somewhere around 70 degrees in here, maybe 69. But these are sitting here for the colonization, and then uh, they'll be in the same temperature for the uh, for the fruiting as well. But uh, this is where they're going to stay for the whole grow. But keeping it dark, no lights, nice and cool, and just letting it colonize. Okay, I'm back, and it has been about um, nine or ten days. About how long it took for this thing to colonize. A lot of people let this uh, let their bulk substrate get colonized a lot. Uh, more dense than this like get get it super white like it's you know all the way covered white but this is all the way what I want is just basically mycelium covering the entire area here kind of you know well well evenly spread I don't really care if it's super white or super super uh, cottony I just want to get it all spread or you can see primordia forming either way so let's so the point is now it's all the way um, colonized in my monotub, it's time for me to switch to um, fruiting conditions. So fruiting conditions, what I'm going to do is basically just take these, these little plastic, or sorry, take all these pieces of tape and put on micropore tape in its place so there's more uh, fresh air exchange going throughout the tub. So take those off, take that off, and then I'm going to spray the top of this uh, top of the substrate with these misting sprayers which will make a lot of fine little little pieces of fine little water bubbles all over the uh, the top here and those are basically you put those there so that they can evaporate and when they evaporate that's what forms primordia primordia is like see you can see already some primordia here primordia is a little bunched up pieces of mycelium here so these little primordia form little bunches of mycelium and those turn into pins that turn into the fruiting bodies eventually but that's how they start is by forming primordia which is like basically a bunched up mycelium and then the pins or the fruit start there the base of the pinheads start where the primordia are forming so like I said take these old covers off the holes put micropore tape on everything and I'm gonna go get this in the closet and then I'll spray it down with some of these misters and show you my light setup and how I've got everything for fruiting. But this is, basically all I'll do to fruiting is replace these tape with micropore tape and spray it down once and then uh, get my light bulb in there. 
So I'll be back in a, oh, actually, before I go back, here's the, uh, here's the cordyceps. I tried to knock it with a liquid culture. These are real slow. Cordyceps, I'm not seeing anything. Lion's mane, I had to, I had to inoculate it a second time, and it's barely got that little bitty tiny dot there on lion's mane going. Um, the other lion's mane's got a little bitty dot there as well, but it's, you almost can't even see that one. The reishi is same thing, a very little bitty tiny speck there in the middle. The antler reishi has a little bit on there. You can see a little bit of dot. And then the, uh, the turkey tail is blowing everything else out of the water. It's just almost all the way colonized to the edge of this agar plate. So. Uh, that's how these things are all kind of colonizing from my liquid cultures I got the other day. Uh, if you guys want me to want to see me grow any of these, these are all kind of wood loving type mushrooms. I'm really excited to grow the lion's mane and the, uh, but uh, if you guys want me to grow any of these and uh, make a video about it, let me know in the comments. But I'm probably going to do a video growing the lion's mane. And since the turkey tail is taken out first, maybe I'll just do that first. But uh, definitely I want to grow lion's mane because it's uh, one of the newest ones out of all of them. But anyway, yeah, if you want to see any of those particular strains grown out, the antler ratio, I'm not sure about that because that's supposed to take a very long time. But uh, probably going to do the lion's mane. But either way, let me know what you guys think in the comments. And I'll be back in a second while I've got this, uh, these pieces of tape taken off, the microport tape covering it, and I'm in my closet with a little setup there in uh, my lighting setup. So back in a second. Hey, decided to free these things. Like it's just the same way as I was leaving for my, um, for the, colonization. I'm going to fruit it here in my closet. I've got the micropore tape on all the holes now so it's getting good fresh air exchange. FAE is something they talk about a lot. It stands for fresh air exchange and that's what the mushrooms need because they they uh, breathe oxygen they exhale CO2 basically so they need constant oxygen coming in and they need the CO2 going out so I think actually it flows where it comes out of it comes in the ends and flows out by the bottom because the CO2 is heavier. So I'm, I'm assuming that's how the flow of this monotub works. But anyway, here's the setup, the monotub in here. And I've got this little light just sticking on a pole hanging off my closet, uh, you know, basically a pole to stick in there. So the light isn't 100% necessary to have a light for fruiting uh, mushrooms, but uh, I use it. I have it on 12 hours each day is what I'm going to do. And basically I'm using it because it gives the mushrooms a direction to grow so if there's no if there's no light and the mushrooms are kind of all over the place if there's a light they kind of grow towards the light so this will have mushrooms growing up instead of just all over the place you know free for all but like a lot of people always insist uh, lights aren't 100 percent necessary what is necessary is fresh air exchange and moisture there should be enough moisture in here for the first flush but I'm gonna go ahead and spray it down more, just to get a little more, a uh, little more of these little water, water particles all over the, uh, all over the top of the substrate here, so it has some else to uh, evaporate. Basically, when the water evaporates off of the mycelium, is when these primordia and the fruiting bodies form. So I use these. This is a great little sprayer for misting. This is a it's a fine mist sprayer, and it's actually out of water. Let me grab the other one. So these are fine mist sprayers off of Amazon, and they mist really well. You can, I guess you can't see the mist, but it's it's coming out, and it's super fine. And now it's all over all of this mycelium, starting to get out that real misty white, covered in water particle look. So we'll take a little close up of this. So there you go, you can see this is a million particles of water all over the mycelium. And that's what I want to um, start evaporating. So at this point, you know, a lot of people leave their monotubs untouched, especially when it's a uh, modified monotub like this with the air. But I don't do that. Well, I, I, want, I go ahead and I mist it and fan it all the time. So when those, when all that, um, when all that, uh, water gets off the top there i'll come in and mist it again or if i don't see you know a lot of water on the lid here i'll come and mist it again but basically misting and fanning is what helps these things along so i'll be coming in two or three times a day just come in here and, and fan it so basically just fanning it with the lid here pumping it about 60 times or so and then uh that's it so this is a just a 
once these things go to fruiting, this is a, the thing you need to do over and over. You need to come in every day. Basically, every time you, you're bored and you want to go look at your mushrooms or your mycelium or whatever, you come in every day, three, four, however many times a day you want. And you come in and you fan it. You're causing extra air exchange and you are helping to evaporate the water off the top of the mycelium there. So this is basically the best way to, to ensure a good um, turnout on your on your, uh, your your fruiting. So either way, this is what I'll be doing for the next however many days. I'll come back as soon as we got some little pins growing in here. I'll tell you how far, how long it took to get to that point. Like I said it was nine days from going to bulk substrate to changing over to fruiting conditions. And I'm assuming it'll be within about 10 days we'll start seeing some pins. Probably way before that, but we'll see. But either way, that's where we're at. And like I said, this uh, this deer calf is definitely a pretty aggressive colonizer. So I, I expect some some pinning happening very soon. Especially, like I said, the, the primordia already started forming. Over there you can see primordia, a couple little chunks here and there of primordia forming. So I think there'll be pins in here before we know it. Anyway, I'll be back when the pins start and we'll see how quickly these suckers will grow. Okay, I'm about five or six days in the fruiting conditions here. And I just noticed my first pins starting to form. So let's take a look at those and see what those look like. I just got to spray it down again. I spray this way more than I probably should, but it's fine. Spray it and missed it. Spray it and missed it. But either way, here's the pins forming. Here's the biggest one that's formed so far. This little thing here. Whoop. A little pin there. There's a couple more you can see forming here. Little babies. There's, let's see. They're really hard to see, but there's a few forming here all over the place. One there. A couple there. A few there. Either way, that is the very first formation of it. It is, as, let's just say, six days into fruiting conditions. And they are all over the place, little... Little pins, pinning, little mushrooms pinning, starting to form finally. So we'll say it's about six days into fruiting conditions, and we will keep monitoring this. I'll just be back probably once they start growing, because once they start pinning, they really start growing pretty fast, actually. So it won't be long. Hopefully, we'll get a good pin set. It'll be a nice full bin here. But either way, that's what it looks like when they very first start. It's just little pinheads all over the place starting to form the Russian bodies so there you go back in a few days probably shouldn't take more than three or four to get the full flush out here and see what they look like and be able to finish this video up okay I'm back it is two days after the first little pins showed up and here's what happens basically 40 yeah it's probably about 48 hours after those first little bitty tiny pins so now we got mushrooms popping up everywhere there's a little blank patch over there. For the most part, they're everywhere. At this point, I'm not really misting anymore. All I'm doing is kind of fanning every once in a while. I don't even have to do that, really. But uh, kind of just coming in and looking at them all the time is what I do. So these are coming up, and now they're really going to come up fast. Like I said, this is two days from the, since those first little baby pins formed. And they're getting real actual fruited bodies all over the place. So we'll see how long it is until we get these things big enough and their bills are breaking. And I'm basically going to let these grow up right up until their bells break. And that's when I take them before their spores are going to dump out all over the substrate. So, yep, we'll see. I'll come back when the bells are breaking on these and see how long that is from now. But like I said, it's been two days since they first fruited. It's been uh, eight days since I put them in fruiting condition. So, they're moving right along. I should have fruits ready to harvest here in about, uh, I would say, three days-ish. Maybe more. I'm not sure. Anyway, I'll be back when it's time to harvest some of these. Okay, I just took a look in the bin. And I saw something that I think is a slight mistake. But it's mainly, I'm thinking, because of where I'm fruiting these. Either way, these are 10 days into fruiting conditions. You can see the, the uh, mushrooms haven't opened up yet. None of them opened up yet, but they're, they're fruiting pretty well. But what I noticed on them that I don't like is at the bottoms of them, you can see a little fuzziness. So a little fuzziness around the bottoms of these mushrooms. It isn't bad. Obviously, they can be a lot fuzzier than that at the bottom. But it's called uh, fuzzy feet. And it's caused by CO2 levels being high at the bottom there. And I think if these things have a 
problem here. They stall or anything else happens bad. I think the main reason it would be is because of the CO2 level in here. Even though I have been fanning and I've got the modded tub uh, with fresh air exchange and whatnot, the problem I'm, I think I have here, which if I do subsequent grows, I'll change that. But the problem I think I didn't think about is that I'm, I'm fruiting in this small little closet here. I have the door shut. So it's very little uh, area, very little um, volume of air in this closet. So if this thing does make CO2, it all settles in the bottom of the closet here and there's nowhere for it to go. So I think ideally, if I did this again, I would have it up on a stand where the escaping CO2 would fall down to the floor a few feet below where it is. So it's all fresh air coming in rather than having it sit down and then pulled CO2 inside the closet, which that's just a theory, but I think if I have fuzzy feet or a uh, inadequate fresh air exchange, it's because of that. It's sitting down here on the floor where the CO2 is pulling naturally in the closet because the CO2 is heavier than air. So I'm gonna ride this grow out like this but in the future, I think if I do this, it'll be up on a stand where the CO2 can fall away from the bin rather than the bin be sitting and pulled up CO2 on the air. But either way, that was just something I thought I'd mention that sometimes growing mushrooms will get fuzzy feet where it looks fuzzy at the bottom there. And that's caused by basically a not good enough fresh air exchange and CO2 kind of pulling uh, on the substrate there where they're sitting in. So either way, like I said, we're about uh, 10 days since I started fruiting conditions. And these things are getting relatively close to being harvested. Um, some people talk about uh, the... Uh, actually, never mind. So either way, um, the one thing I'm trying to avoid when harvesting is I want to get them harvested once the veil opens... Once the, once the veil kind of separates, but before the spores drop. And that'll be basically the biggest size I can get here without having a spore mess on my substrate, which I'm trying to avoid the spore mess on my substrate. Some people say that once the spores come out, the more more uh, developed the uh, mushrooms are, they have a lot worse taste. So we'll see how that goes. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna try and get them all before any spores drop. And I'm also gonna make store, spore prints for them, so. Uh, I definitely want to get them right before the spores drop and then make some spore prints later in this video as well. But the point is I'm going to try and try and harvest these as their veils break when they're uh, nice and biggest size I can get without dumping spores on the substrate. So either way, I'll be back. Probably, I would think a few of these tops are going to pop open tonight. Maybe some veils break by tomorrow. I'm not sure, but I'll be in here very often finding out when it is time to pull them. And I'll pull them when it's time. Back in a second. Okay, I am back, and it is time to harvest some of these suckers. They have gotten, uh, sorry, the uh, the caps have opened up on these. So the caps have opened up, the bells have broken off, and if I don't harvest them now, they're in danger of dropping spores on my substrate or on the rest of the mushrooms underneath them, and I don't want them to do that. So I'm going to be pulling out the ones that have the open caps on them, pink, and the, like I said, the uh, separated uh, veils, you can see them there, there, there. I might just pull out the whole chunk that's uh, associated with the ones with the busted veils. Maybe this big chunk here, maybe this big cluster here. But the point is I need to get those out of there before they dump spores. So, I'm gonna do a little demonstration of how to pull these out of there. The whole purpose, or the whole uh, goal, when you're harvesting these, is to get the mushroom out intact while leaving your substrate as intact as you can leave it. So here's one with a separated um, veil there. So basically you just come in here, you grab it, and you twist and pull at the same time. This one's hooked up to another mushroom, so it's a little tricky, but basically I'm gonna twist and pull, maybe rock it back and forth a little bit. But there, twist and pull, and you feel a little pop, and it basically comes out of there. So right there you can see a little patch that's missing there of substrate, but I did a pretty good job. I got barely any, I got whatever was basically attached to the mushroom there and uh, got it out of there without any damage to the mushroom and minimal damage to the substrate. So that's basically how that was picked. On the larger clumps, it's not so easy like that. So this like clump right here is just gonna take up a whole patch of 
Uh, mushrooms is obviously going to take all the substrate underneath it. So this is going to get a little trickier pulling out the whole patch, but it's same same concept where you just basically kind of pop the whole patch off and twist and try and get it to lift off the substrate without pulling the substrate with it. In the case that it pulls off substrate with it, if, if it's a piece you can just like pull, pull off there and pat back down, that's fine too. But uh, you know, like I said, we're trying to leave this substrate as as uh, undisturbed as we can while we're ripping stuff off the top of it. So in, in if they, a couple things rip off the top with it, then you just kind of if they're still sitting there, you can pat down whatever substrates to kind of lift it up or whatever. But uh, the point is, uh, that's that's your whole purpose is trying to get the mushrooms out without ruining your substrate because you want to use a substrate for as many additional flushes as you can get after this first one so this isn't even the, this is basically the first flush but i'm going to go step by step pulling out you know the ones that need to go before they dump and leaving the smaller ones in here to keep going so uh either way that's that's harvesting in a nutshell and i'll be back in a second because i'm going to take these and go make some spore prints and do a uh a clone uh, make a clone with makes sorry clone one of these with a tissue culture so back in a second for the spore prints. Okay, I just got done harvesting the first chunk of uh, these deer caps. And for this video, we're gonna do a little demonstration on how to make spore prints. And this is a real simple thing. This is a lot simpler than the rest of these processes, but basically you're just gonna, you can, sometimes you can pop off the, the cap without breaking it, but I'm gonna use scissors. So you sterilize your scissors, obviously. And then you basically just cut them off right up near the cap so you can lay it down flat on this foil here. Ooh, I'm not doing a very good job cutting. There you go. So cut it off there. And then I'll get it in my foil here where I want to put it. There we go. So you use foil. Basically foil is pretty, uh, foil is pretty uh, clean as it comes off, off the roll. Pretty much sterilized. Anyway, so I'm putting on this foil. I've made it this shape so I can just fold it over the top into a little square when I'm done. Um, all you do, like I said, is just cut off the cap, stick it on there. I got a little bit of water over here on the side, and a lot of people use a dropper, but I'm too lazy to go get a dropper and do that. So I just get a little piece of a little drop of water on my finger. Boink! Touch a little bit of water on top of each of these. Helps them drop their spores a little easier. And uh, basically, all I do now after I get the little dot of water put on each of them is close up this little bin leave them on their foil there for about 24 to 48 hours and they will dump black spores all over the place well not all over the place in their little their little uh, shape of their mushroom head there they're gonna drop black spores all over this um, foil hopefully so either way I'll be back in about 24 to 48 hours and we'll check out these spore prints All right, I just got done popping off the uh, the top of this deer cap to make a spore print with. So now, in the spirit of preserving the genetics, even though I don't think these are that great of mushrooms, deer caps, but anyway, in the spirit of preserving genetics, I'm gonna take this one and I'm going to make a clone out of it using a tissue culture from the inside of this stem. So basically, just take this, like I said, I already have my blade sterilized. I have my oven tech going. I'm just going to take this stock here, split it in two, toss the other half. And I'm going to take this little white tissuey area here and chop it up. I'm going to chop a little chunk out. Boom. Boom. This is not the easiest stuff to cut and I think my I think this razor blade has been used up. It is pretty dull I think actually or it would have already cut through this. But there we go, there's a little chunk of tissue right there. I'm gonna take this and drop it on my agar plate. Okay, there we go. And that is, uh, come on. Okay, it came off finally, sheesh. All right, there is cloning 101. Just cut a little chunk of tissue out of the middle Dropped it on my agar plate, and this is basically gonna turn back into mycelium and colonize the plate. So that's how easy it is to clone right there. Super simple. It's a little tricky to cut with a dull razor blade, but 
But um, other than that, it's pretty easy to do. So that's calling a nutshell. That thing's gonna take off just like any other colonized plate, except for it's bump, jumping around in there. Anyway, that's gonna take off like any other colonized plate. Uh, just my ceiling's gonna grow across it and I may have to clean it up or not, but we'll see. Either way, that's gonna preserve the exact genetics of that um, mushroom that I took this little cut off of. So that's the neat, uh, the upside of cloning is you're gonna get the exact genetics so you can isolate genetics as far as um, bigger, better clusters, you know, stronger, taller, faster growing fruits, whatever. You can isolate those genetics through cloning by cloning the ones with the characteristics you want to propagate. So either way, that's cloning in a nutshell. And I'll be back when I have my spore prints ready. And we'll take a look at those. And that'll basically be a wrap on this video of home mycology slash mushroom cultivation. See you in a second. Okay, I said it was going to be between 24 and 48 hours for these spore prints to, to uh, be done. But it's actually only been, it's only been about 20 hours maybe since yesterday. But uh, I looked in here and I could see that they were already dropping them on there. So there's a spore print right there. Basically, just the, uh, <laughs> the spores drop out of the gills there and gives you an exact uh, kind of picture how it was there. It was, it was split there, it was facing that way. It's exactly what it looks like there. So basically just, all these gills just start dumping their spores until they form up on there. And that's it. I know I'm not using gloves right now, but generally spore prints are kind of a, they usually end up being slightly dirty anyway. And I'll just clean it up later if I ever put it on agar, if I ever grow these again. But I apologize for not putting it on gloves. So basically with these spore prints, all I'm gonna do is basically flip it over and then fold it up and that's a wrap there you go there's that that and that and this spore print is done I'm going to leave them in this bin for a little bit longer just to kind of dry out a little bit just make sure they're not moisture on them um, because once I store them I don't want there to be moisture there's a good one a couple little spotty spots I don't want them to be moisture on these um, when I'm storing them to grow other mold or whatever, have something to compete with these spores, but that is a, these are good spore prints. And um, I can basically take these, once I fold them up here, and I can put them in this little plastic Ziploc baggie or a sandwich bag or anything like that. What I'm gonna do is actually, uh, I, I, honestly, I don't even like these deer caps, but what I would do if I did like them, I'll probably just toss these in the trash, but uh, what I would do if I did like them, is vacuum seal them with a little, little vacuum sealer I have in a little little pouch and just keep them forever that way. But uh, that's basically it from spore to spore with these uh, mushrooms I got here. Um, it was a long process. Uh, things I didn't talk about are uh, sometimes people want to save the mushrooms for long-term storage. And one way to do that is to, well, basically the only way to do that is to dry them out. And some people talk about, like, dry them out by sitting out somewhere dry and wind, you know, air flowing through or whatever. But just use a dehumidifier. You dry them out with a dehumidifier at about 130 degrees for the dehumidifier for about 12 hours. You want to dry them out till they're all the way dry and cracker-like, crispy. That way no mold can get on them after they've been dried but yeah uh, that's how you dry them like i said about one about 130 degrees on your dehydrator for about 12 hours and they'll be crispy cracker like cracker like that's what that's the word people use all the time the cracker like consistency crispy cracker like and uh they'll be dry at that point and at that point you can store them in a glass jar with some uh Silica packets are the best way to keep them dry, usually. Um, other things I didn't talk about are how to prepare them. So, uh, usually mushrooms, you can, you can usually eat them when they're fresh grown or whatever, but if you want them to actually taste good, you want to break down some of the chitin in them, things like that, you want to make them more edible and tastier. Uh, a lot of people saute them in uh, oil or butter, things like that. Um, Beyond that, that's about it for 
the beginners, you know, Cliff's notes to home mushroom cultivation. If you guys watch this far, I appreciate you. If you haven't yet, please like, comment, subscribe. And like I said in the first of this video, uh, let me know which one of those strains you want me to grow for the wood loving mushrooms between lion's mane, um, turkey tail, and the two different kinds of reishis I did. Um, I don't think the cordyceps, uh, that might be out of my, my skill level at this point, but uh, I might come back to that later in the future if I can figure it out. But either way, appreciate you guys watching this far, and I'll see you guys on the next video. Peace.